The best life involves you playing with cute girls to give them fairy powers. If you don't believe me, then check out this story. We kick things off with our hero in the middle of some spicy activity with his elf slaves, after which we see an older elf girl. She tells the younger elf girls to marvel in front of their master's power, and then we learn that our hero's name is Hashi Bami Yoke. The older elf girl tells him that they can work for each other's mutual benefit because they both have things that the other desires. This is why from now on, she wants him to play with her elf girls every night. This sounds like a dream come true for any boy out there, and anyone who says otherwise they not like us. Now, our hero talks to us and says that he has a lot of worries. His first issue is that he's short, then he states that he has no spare time for studying, and he also seems to have some weird obsession with leather shoes. Now, we see a cute girl who ponders if there is any kind of spirit that can help her with studying while she's sleeping, and this catches Hashi's attention. He then tells us that he also needs to regularly play around with girls in the night so that he can fulfill his purpose. He is seen flying around from house to house and eventually enters the room of the same girl we saw earlier. She happens to be a girl from Hashi's class, named Kasaka, and she is fast asleep on her desk. Our hero does not care who the girl is, because she had called upon him while he was near her. Keeping this in mind, he has to play with her, which means that he is going to do her homework. He has to keep things PG for now, but that changes the moment he gets a good look at her. As soon as his eyes fall upon her twin peaks, his intrusive thoughts kick in immediately and our hero considers becoming a villain. Luckily, before he turns into the diddler, Hashi says he can't play with Kasaka like this and he needs to control his shady intentions. Otherwise, he will never be able to forgive himself. He also mentions that the only acceptable thing for him to do as a naughty dwarf is to help cute girls like Kasaka with her studies. Hashi is so noble over here that you might even confuse him with a demon slayer. Anyway, he goes ahead and completes her homework like a true genius. Of course, this does have an adverse effect on him as he does not get any sleep and it reflects in his daily behavior. The next day in school, we see it in full effect when our hero yawns in class and catches the attention of the other students. Naturally, this also annoys the class teacher, so he whacks Hashi with a rolled-up notebook and asks him if this is the time to be sleeping. This is not a class for Snorlax enthusiasts, so Hashi says sorry for dozing off, but then the teacher asks him for his homework. That's when he realizes that he was so busy doing homework for other girls that he didn't have the time to do his own. Despite the obvious issues, Hashi is still happy to see Kasaka joyfully talking to her friends about finishing her homework while she was asleep. They don't believe her, but she says that it was most definitely the work of a spirit. Our hero reflects upon how he is always ready to help others out. But as he gleefully dreams about his acts, one of the girls from class slams her hand on the desk and calls out his name. Her name is Yama Sashi, and she is the class representative. So Hashi asks her if she needs help with anything. However, Yama is not too thrilled to see him forgetting to turn in his homework. So she confronts him about it. He tries to talk his way out of this sudden situation, but Yama is also annoyed by the fact that he has a nonchalant look on his face even when he gets into trouble. Our hero does not know what to do, so he bows down to Yama and says he's sorry. Just like any other man out there, Hashi knows that this is the only thing he can do as of now to calm things down. Plus, there is also the fact that Yama is only looking at him as he is the sole person who does not take his classes seriously. Anyway, she tells him not to bow his head to her, and even blushes as she asks him to focus on being more sincere with his homework. It looks like this girl has some affection towards our hero, but she does not want to overly display it. This causes Hashi to act out and he tells Yama that it's not like he does not want to do his homework. He knows that he must do something about it, 
and it leads Yama to ask what is leading to his troubles. Of course, our hero can't really tell her the specifics of it, so he only states that it's an issue out of his control. He also states that he can't tell her what the problem is, and this makes Yama a bit more annoyed. For some reason, she thinks that our hero is a shady creep, but he tells her that's not what he was hinting at. Sadly, the only Olympic game that girls are good at is jumping to conclusions. Yama has had enough of playing around, so she asks Hashi to spill the beans. He pauses once again, and it leads her to state once again that he's ashamed to tell her what the truth is. Hashi maintains that he is not able to reveal the truth of his issues, but this only confirms her suspicions of him being a shady creep. That's exactly what she calls him as she walks away. Yama also states that she should never have worried so much about such a SUS character, and our hero laments his situation. However, it's not like he can do anything about it, so he just accepts his fate. After all, the blood of the spirits run through him and him alone. He compares himself to a leprechaun, because these beings would also go ahead and shine people's shoes in the middle of the night. Back in the day, the people of Europe would call these creatures naughty dwarves, which is where Hashi takes his inspiration from. Of course, there were other spirits as well, such as fairies, sylphs, and countless others. It turns out that these beasts had shifted to the country of Japan in the Meiji period and had become part of the population since then. After all, Europe was not easy to live in during the Industrial Revolution, so Japan made for the perfect spot as it was the land for deities and spirits. As a result of this, the fairies and elves would mix their bloodlines with the humans and leave behind mixed breeds. That also includes our hero's bloodline, which explains why he has such powers. The problem for him is not his power, but rather the impulses that his naughty dwarf blood comes with. He keeps getting intrusive thoughts, as we had seen earlier when he had helped Kasaka with her homework. If he is not able to keep these impulses in check, it becomes very difficult for him to live his daily life. He imagines that his life would be a lot simpler if he did not have to wander around at night, looking for girls to play with. On top of that, there is the problem of him not being able to enter a home unless he is invited to do so. This explains how he was able to enter Kasaka's house, as she had prayed for a spirit to help her with her homework. Now, we see Hashi in the middle of the streets at night, and he laments that he has no one to play with as of now. He does not care who it might be, because he simply wants to play with someone. At this very moment, we see a cute girl right behind him, and it's none other than Yama who asks if our hero is all right. She wonders if he is feeling ill, but Hashi tells her that he is fine. Of course, the issue for him is that the curvy babe has left her twin peaks to be openly seen by him so his intrusive thoughts kick in once again. She's a bit confused, so our hero tries to fight back his naughty impulses, but it is of no use at all. He can't stop his hands from reaching out, and he ends up doing what no gentleman should ever do. As expected, the girl is shocked by what she has just experienced, but Hashi can only think about the thumping sounds of his heartbeats. He does not know what this kind of sensation is, but he also needs to realize what he has just done. He tries to apologize and says that he does not have any shady intentions, but he can't deny the fact that he has committed a prank of the nastiest kind. However, the response he gets is something that he did not expect at all. The girl starts to act in uncontrollable ways, and it looks as if she is experiencing some kind of intense passion. After what seems like a release, she blushes and says that something has happened to her blood. None of this makes any sense to our hero, but Yama seems to have understood what this is. She holds his hand and asks him to follow her, because there is something that she needs to verify. Hashi fears the worst, but he plays along for now and is eventually taken to her house. 
which is a giant mansion. Our hero is shocked to see the size of this place, so he asks Yama if it's all right for them to intrude at such an hour. The curvy babe does not care and drags Hashi inside because she knows what she is doing. Now, she sits down and nervously asks him to do more to her, just like he had done earlier. This comes as a shocker to Hashi, but Yama tells him to touch more places which he has never touched before. This is like a dream come true for any teenage boy, but our hero does not know if this is a test or real life. Yama once again tells him to do as she says, but he is not sure if touching her sensitive areas is the right way to go. It's obvious that he also wants to do these things, and that too in a way where he can't hold back. On top of that, he seems to have much stronger impulses towards Yama, more than anyone else. He can't hold himself any longer. So the moment Yama tells him to do it again, Hashi decides to unleash the beast. He goes straight for her twin peaks, but it's at this very moment when another cute girl enters the room. She asks Yama if she has brought a guest with her, but when she sees the shady things they are doing with each other, she states that they just might be acting out their desires. Suddenly, two other cute girls make their way to the scene and they ask what Yama is doing with a boy. It seems to be a very big deal for Yama to have a romantic interest, but they decide to blame both of them for their actions. Yama is at fault for calling a boy to her place, and Hashi is at fault for giving in to his intrusive thoughts. Of course, he does not like the fact that they think he is trying to have his way with Yama, but the girls don't even listen to him. Instead, they tell Yama to control herself and be more careful, but she tries to clear the confusion by saying Hashi is actually an amazing boy. She goes on to confess that she felt something special even when he touched her for a bit, which is a rather bold statement to make. However, this seems to make the other girls take this matter more seriously, even though Hashi is still trying to figure out what he has gotten himself into. Now, one of the girls asks Yama if she has given her flower to our hero, and this causes a hilarious moment. The other girls start asking her how far along she and Hashi have done shady things to each other. So our hero tells his school rep that she needs to work on her phrasing. Yama does not see any issues with this, but he states that her words are not exactly framed the right way. Of course, this only makes matters worse when Yama says that she felt amazing when Hashi touched her Twin Peaks. This causes the other girls to stand there in shock, and even Hashi tells her not to use such words. Now, one of the other girls seems to have understood what Yama meant by this, so she asks her friends to check out Yama's ears, and she also seems to refer to her as Oni-chan. This is a bit confusing for our hero, but then the girls feel Yama's ears and notice that they are becoming a bit pointy. The girls seem to have understood what's going on, so they take one more confirmation from Yama that her ears became this way only after Hashi touched her. Essentially, this means that her blood has awakened, and she has our hero to thank for it. Yama tries to justify herself now by saying she did not have any shady intentions, but only wanted to see what kind of powers Hashi had. Of course, the other girls find the nature of this power a bit odd. After all, it's not every day that you see a boy awakening elf blood by touching on some Twin Peaks. Yama has had enough of this because she wants to see actual proof rather than arguing about it. With this, she grabs Hashi's hand and brings him towards her, much to his amusement. The funny thing is that it's not just Yama, but all the other girls as well who make him enjoy their Twin Peaks to see if he can awaken their blood too. Our hero is pretty much in heaven right now because the girls are getting excited from his actions. As luck would have it, Hashi's powers come to the party once again, and he is able to turn all these girls into elves with the magic of his shady touch. Neither her nor the elf girls are able to digest this fact, so they wonder what on earth is going on over here. 
Hashi realizes that this is to do with what Yama was saying earlier. But before he can put his mind to it, a sudden surge of energy explodes in front of him. Just like that, we see the older elf girl making an appearance, and her name seems to be Yami. She is the elf queen, and the other girls bow give her the necessary respect. Now it's time to get down to business, so Yami asks the other girls what they felt when Hashi touched their twin peaks. They are a bit shy to say it, but a girl named Akira openly declares that she felt good when this happened. She is told not to speak like this, especially because she is a girl, but that does not matter to the Elf Queen. She orders the other girls to answer her, so they apologize for being shy. Now, we turn to a girl named Suki, who confesses that she felt a lot of excitement when she was touched by our hero. The others also agree with her, and they come to the consensus that none of them would have had pointy ears if they did not feel the passion from Hashi's touch. Yami asks them if they know what this means, so they state that the blood which was dormant in them for all this time has finally started to awaken. They are all in agreement over this, but Hashi raises his hand because he has some doubts. He wants an explanation for all of this, so Yami decides to entertain him. She has no shame as she tells him to play with one of the girls even more, but our hero does not know if that is a good idea. He stands there clueless, so the elf queen explains that he will understand this only after he gives it a go. Hashi is in a rather unique position now because even if he is being told to choose one of the girls and go further with them, he is a bit spoiled for choice. Yami realizes that Hashi is not going to make a choice quickly, so she turns to the elf girls and tells them to choose a candidate from themselves. Basically, it looks like the one whose power will awaken the most will go on to become the next elf queen. Suki says that it only makes sense for the oldest of the lot to go ahead, and it so happens to be her. However, Yama says that she should be the one to try it out because she is the one who brought Hashi here in the first place. The girls are amazed by her initiative, but she also says that Suki is a bit too responsible when it comes to the topic of Elf Queen. On top of that, it would not be right to hand over her body to Hashi right after meeting him. Since Yama is our hero's classmate, it only makes sense for her to be the one going in. Hashi asks her if she is sure about this, but she counters that her opinion is not relevant here. It's all part of her duty as an elf, and she can't go back on her loyalty to her people. Plus, the Elf Queen has issued the order, so it's not like she can say no to her. She does not get why Hashi is being so hesitant, so she asks him if he does not like what he sees. She even calls him a shady creep again, so Hashi hilariously says that's not what he means. Either way, he is stuck with her, and she makes it known to him by slamming her hand on the desk once again. The Elf Queen figures that our hero can't just go ahead and do as he pleases if Yama is doing it as per an order, so she gives him permission to mess with her as much as he wants. Now, Hashi approaches Yama, but thinks back to how he's usually enjoyed messing with people before. It was different before because his targets were not aware of what he would be doing to them, but in this case, he is being told by the target to do whatever he wants to them. As expected, he is conflicted for a moment, but soon enough, he realizes that he gets to play with his class rep as much as he wants. His intrusive thoughts kick in, as do his shady impulses, and they don't stop at all. It is because of this impulse that he does things he would never do otherwise, especially those that he would consider to be forbidden. Enough is enough, so he goes ahead and begins to play with Yama as he wishes. Her reactions are a bit much, so our hero turns to Yami to see if she is fine with this. The Elf Queen tells him that he may continue, so our hero unleashes his inner beast. Seeing this makes Yami realize something about Hashi, and then we see Yama going mad over his actions. Things are getting extremely passionate, so Yami feels that this should be enough for now. She tells Hashi to stop, so he does as he's told, 
but then it looks like Yama is going through some kind of transformation. Everyone gazes on in shock and wonder as they see her in her new form, as she now looks like a mythical elf girl from another world. Now, the elf queen asks Hashi if he is a descendant of the leprechauns, and he is surprised by how she was able to spot this so easily. Yami says that it is expected for her to know these things, because she is the queen of this country in the nighttime. She also knows that the recent tinge which Yama had felt was because of a naughty dwarf's power. She then points out that Hashi has been facing issues due to his shady impulses in the night, and this makes our hero speechless. The Elf Queen goes on to state that the blood that lies within him is very strong due to the spirits they come from. This means that all of his shady acts have the same kind of power as a mana intervention. It is this power that was strong enough to awaken the blood that had lain dormant inside Yama for all these years. Hashi does not get what she means by power of blood, so Yami explains that elves also have the blood of spirits running through them just like humans. Adding to this, she states that it's the blood of these spirits that are chosen to rule over the world. This is also known as the blood of the royal elves, and the girls our hero has just touched happen to be from that class of elves. Hashi now looks at Yama, who does look like an elf, but is also dressed in a way that would awaken anyone's shady intentions. She tells him not to look at her, and she seems to be a but flustered by everything that has happened here. Hashi says sorry, but he confesses to us that Yama is looking way too appealing for him not to gaze at her like this. Yami has all the info she needs, so she asks our hero for his full name and he gives it to her in awkward fashion. This makes the Elf Queen give a mischievous grin, and she points out that Hashi's full name reminds her of the Asian hazel trees which are loved by tree spirits. Yami now looks at her elf girls and calls out to them by their names, so that it becomes easy for us to know who they are. There's Yama, the Shai Suki, the Naughty Akira, and the Tomboy Koyo, all of whom are ordered by Yami as their Elf Queen, aunt, and guardian. The order is that they will have to let our hero play with them as much as he wants, and it causes quite the reaction. Koyo and Yama are a bit too flustered, but Akira seems to like this order, and Suki is neutral towards it. Hashi asks Yami what is the meaning of all this, but she tells him that this is beneficial for him as well. He does not get this, so the Elf Queen tells Yama to explain this to Hashi. She states that the Queen of Elves is also the Queen of Spirits, so if one of these girls were to awaken their powers and become the next Elf Queen, then they will be able to remove the naughty impulses that Hashi feels every night. Normally, a teenage boy would object to this, but Hashi knows that he has a very big problem to deal with every night. It all starts to make sense now, and even Yama realizes the reason why our hero was never able to give in his homework was due to the fact that he was acting on his impulses every night. She also confirms that he is short because of his dwarf blood, but at this point it just feels like a cheap shot. However, the class rep says that if she became the elf queen and freed his impulses, then our hero could also gain a few inches in his height. This naturally puts a smile on his face because it would be great for him to grow taller. Now that everything is set, we move back to the scene we saw at the beginning, where Yami is telling the girls to accept and praise our hero's powers. She then tells Hashi that this arrangement will be of interest to him as well as the elf girls. This is why from now on, for every night, she wants him to play with her girls however he would like. Now, Hashi starts thinking to himself and considers his luck as he now has the permission to enjoy the bodies of his new slave girls in whatever way he likes. This will allow him to control his intrusive thoughts that have been holding him back for so long. Also, if one of these girls awakens her powers, then she can help him get rid of his impulses as well. Also, there's the hope that he might grow a few inches too. With this in mind, Yami asks our hero what he has to say about the plan, 
so he openly declares that he will do it. As a matter of fact, he's so excited about this that he begs them to allow him to do this task. Now, it's time for the girls to mention how they feel about this. Koyo doesn't know how to put her feelings into words. Akira is very excited to see how Hashi is going to play with her. Suki says that she is pleased to work with our hero from now on, but Yama says that Hashi should not expect her to do the same things she did with him today for every other day. Now that the girls are on board, Yami wants to get down to business as soon as possible. She asks Hashi if he can live in the estate starting tonight. As expected, everyone is shocked to hear this. Now, we shift to the mansion where we see our hero in the shower with Suki. She wants him to do to her what he was doing with Yama, and it presents a tricky situation to him. In order to understand how he got here, we move back in time to when Yami asked him to shift into the house. She gets ready to leave and says that she will contact both of Hashi's parents, so he does not need to explain anything to them. Our hero nods along and then the elf queen vanishes from plain sight. Now, it's just him and the girls looking at each other in the middle of an awkward silence. Hashi knows this is not an ideal situation, as he is now in the midst of the same girls he is going to do shady things to for a while. Naturally, he is going to feel a bit conscious. Now all of a sudden, Hashi notices that Yama has turned back to a normal girl again. Not only that, the other girls have also lost their elf ears. This could be because none of the girls have fully awakened their powers yet. So Yama decides to suggest something spicy to our hero. However, before she can say anything further, Suki suggests eating dinner first, so the elf girl agrees. Suki seems to have already gotten a lot of items by going shopping earlier, so she decides to cook for everyone. She puts on the apron and asks our hero if he is hungry, but he says that he has already eaten his food. This doesn't stop Suki, so she asks him if he would like to take a bath instead. This would be a good way for him to spend his time while the girls eat their food. Hashi doesn't think this is a bad idea, so he goes to the bathroom and chills in the massive tub. As he rests, he starts to think about his new slave girls. First of all, there's Suki, who he is guessing to be the oldest of them. She is a very charming girl who is as adorable as a fairy. After her comes Yama, who is familiar with him due to them being in the same class together. She is a beauty who has outstanding style, especially after Hashi saw her elf outfit. Next up is Koyo, who is a tomboy but also has a unique sense of fashion and style. Finally, there's the youngest of them all, Akira, who has massive twin peaks and is an easy pick for those who like lollies. As he bathes in this water, Hashi wonders if it really is a good idea to mess around with such beauties. There's the fact that he does not like to allow himself to do such things, but then he also has to consider that all of these girls are sisters. It's at this very moment that Suki enters the bathroom and causes our hero to panic some more. He wants to know what she is doing here, but she tells him that he does not need to be so formal with her. After all, they are pretty much like stepbrother and stepsister now, which can only mean one thing in today's culture. Suki repeats what Yami had said about the girls needing Hashi's powers and him needing their curvy bodies for his impulses. However, the Suki has come here in nothing but a towel is a bit careless as per what Hashi believes. He would much rather talk properly with her, but she moves in close to him, raising the temperature even further. She tells him that she wants to be naughty with him the next time he decides to unleash the beast, and it makes our hero a bit nervous. Basically, even though Yama was the one to explain the powers and make fun of Suki, it's still the oldest sister who feels that she will be the one to become the next elf queen. This is mainly due to her age, as she feels that things should always be in the right order. Now, this brings us back to the earlier scene where we saw Suki presenting herself to Hashi. 
Of course, he feels that she is being a bit too direct for his liking, but his intrusive thoughts start to kick in. She further tempts him by saying he is the only one she can rely on to give her what she truly desires. She then tells him to do as he pleases with her, and this only instigates his impulses even further. Since he is being asked to do this, he has no other option but to give in and get freaky. To kick things off, he uses the jet spray in the bathroom and unleashes a water attack on Suki. Hashi manages to get what he wants, and he likes what he sees, but the elf girl does not look too impressed with a simple water attack. She asks Hashi if this was all he had, so he wonders what she means by this. Suki explains that even her ears won't change with this because she has not been touched by our hero. She then sticks her arms out and tells him to do more amazing things to her. This pushes Hashi to unleash the beast within, and he goes on to do unspeakable things to Suki. Soon enough, she enjoys the sensation so much that she awakens her powers and transforms her ears. Suki is thankful to our hero for what he has done, but he tells her not to mention it. She also tells him that he should feel free to do a lot more from now on, because that is what it is going to take for her powers to truly awaken. However, as she says this, her towel drops down and this causes our hero to get a full frontal view. He tries to insist that he has not seen anything, but we all know that's just a lie. He decides to run away from the scene before things get even more awkward, but Suki doesn't seem to mind as long as it's him. Later, Hashi gets done with changing his clothes and sits in his bed as he remembers Suki telling him to ask her if he needs anything else. Now, as he takes a look at everything around him, Hashi wonders if this place is a bit too rich for his liking. However, before he can think about anything else, Akira walks into the room with a spicy presentation. She says that she's come here to play, and this only makes things harder for Hashi. We can see that Koyo is also with her, but she is wearing standard pajamas so it's nothing out of the blue. Koyo tells Akira that she is risking a bit too much with her outfit, but she says that she chose it herself keeping in mind that she has to please our hero. With that, Akira approaches Hashi and gets on top of him while Koyo watches on in shock and awe. Her twin peaks can't be avoided, and she also says that she was saving them for our hero all this time. Our hero does not know how he will be able to control himself because his intrusive thoughts are everywhere now. He even tells her that the outfit suits her, but Akira is more interested in knowing if her new master is getting excited upon seeing her like this. Now, all of a sudden, Akira asks Hashi if they should go ahead and do it, but he does not seem to get what she means by this. That's when she says that she wants to do with him what adults usually do with each other at night. This causes Koyo to confront the elf girl because she was told that they were coming here to play cards. Of course, this was just a ploy by Akira to have her way with Hashi, but then she says that she is actually here to play cards and not anything else. This makes our hero a bit calmer because he has no issues with such a safe game. Koyo says sorry on behalf of Akira and her clothes, and she asks Hashi to just go along with them. Hashi seems to be cool, but Akira tempts him further by teasing him about her clothes. She states that he must be wanting to see more than what is already being shown to him, and comments that he really is a man by nature. Of course, he counters that he has said no such thing to her, so she bends low to give him a better view. Hashi's mind is going crazy, but when Akira asks him if he wants to see more, he says no. This surprises her because she is the one who's making a move on him. So she tries once again by saying her clothes are a bit too racy to resist. Despite the temptation, Hashi gives it all he's got and says that they are going a bit off topic. This means that Akira has been caught and she can't fool him anymore. This causes her to rethink her stance on Hashi, as she had believed he was just a fool who only had intrusive thoughts running around in his mind. 
This may be true, but our hero is able to control those thoughts, which makes the elf girl view him in a new light. Hashi is a bit confused, so Akira explains that her true motive with this outfit was to evaluate him. This is more than enough for him to believe that Akira is nothing short of being a devil girl. Koyo is also glad to see that nothing shady has happened, and then she confirms if Akira is done with what she had come here for. If so, then it would be better for Akira to go back to her room. This may be true, but when Akira asks Koyo what she is going to do now, she states that she might just wait here a bit longer. Of course, Akira feels that Koyo is just saying this so that she can get some private time with Hashi. So she teases her about it and says that she should also stay here to make sure Koyo and Hashi don't do anything shady. As expected, Koyo tells her this was not her intention at all. But there's no trusting women these days. With all the drama out of the way, our hero and his two elf slaves now sit together and play a game of old made with each other. Hashi has to go first, but Akira resumes with her flirty behavior and gets cozy with him. This leads Hashi to get nervous, and then the elf girl says that he should choose the place that works best for him. Koyo finds this a bit weird, so she tells Akira to stop saying such things. Despite this, Akira maintains that all is well, but this is clearly not the case with Hashi. His intrusive thoughts have come to the fore once again, and he laments how he is never able to control his impulses whenever he is up against his slave girls. Akira now pushes our hero to hurry up and not take any more time, so he decides he might as well go for it and act shady with her. He proceeds to reach for Akira's twin peaks and gives her a taste of his inner beast. Of course, things get a bit freaky, but Akira calls our hero a creep for acting on his intrusive thoughts. She did not think that he would actually do shady things to her, but Hashi reasons that she was the one who riled him up in the first place. To his surprise, she even admits to it without any hesitation. Akira wants to continue the game, but Koyo thinks that it would be better if they leave soon. However, she disagrees because she wants Koyo to be played with as well. The tomboy girl gets nervous and says that this was not what they had discussed all this while. At the end of it, Akira comes up with an idea, which is that the loser of the game will have to allow Hashi to do whatever he wants to her. This makes everyone a bit nervous, so Hashi asks what would happen if he loses the game. Akira says that they will just have to go on with their current game if this happens, but basically, a girl has to play with Hashi. Time passes by and so does the night, which means that we have no idea what went on with the three of them. It's morning time now, and we can see Yama entering Hashi's room to wake him up from his slumber. She wants to ask him something, but she witnesses a shocking sight upon entering the room. It's our hero who is lying in bed with both Akira as well as Koyo, almost as if they had a thrilling night with each other. As expected, Yama can't control her anger and turns into a demon girl as she scolds her other sisters and wakes them up by force. She berates them and asks how shameless they can be to do such lewd things with their master. Akira reasons that she simply fell asleep while playing cards, and Koyo says sorry even though she simply followed Akira here. Since Yama is a bit too mad, Akira decides to put the blame on Hashi by calling him weak. Our hero counters by saying the allure of both Akira as well as Koya was a bit too much for him to handle, but Yama does not care for any of that and she calls him a fool. Our hero is shocked to see how much Yama is upset with him, so he asks her to wait, but it's of no use as she storms out of the room. Hashi follows after her and asks why she is being so angry about this. She simply asks if he played with Akira and Koya during the night, so he tries to cover for his actions by saying he got swept along by the girls. No matter what he tries to say, it does not have any effect on Yama, because she is not angry at the elf girls, but rather at our hero. Of course, this does not make sense to Hashi, 
because he was told by the elf queen to play with Yama as well as her sisters. However, girls do not like to follow logic when they get jealous, so Yama says that Yami did not specifically tell him to act shady with all the girls. Hashi does not understand anything about this, so she puts it bluntly to him that he can only get freaky with her. Essentially, Yama wants to have a monopoly over Hashi, but he still does not know what he is being dragged into. Now, we shift to the school where Yama is sitting on the stairs and thinking about her desires for Hashi. We switch to the classroom where all the students are chatting with each other. So Yama decides to bring some order to the scene as she is the class rep. She tells all the kids to be quiet and get seated as the teacher will be walking in soon. The other students are not too pleased to see her bossing them around, and they comment on how Yama always has something to say in the morning. In the middle of all this, Hashi can be seen thinking about what Yama had told him earlier at the mansion. He knows that Yama is an honest and serious girl in his eyes, and we see it in full effect when she answers a question in class. All the kids are in awe of her intelligence and they congratulate her for giving the answer. This proves to Hashi that Yama is loved by everyone in their class. As the day progresses, we see the students reporting to Yama as if she is also a teacher and mentor. The day is going about just like any other, but then Yama leaves the class so Hashi follows after her as he does not want to be left behind. She asks him if he needs anything, but he actually has a lot of praise that he would like to tell her about. Hashi says that he has once again realized how awesome his class rep is. This is because she is diligent and responsible each and every day. It does not affect her much to hear this, because she just thinks that she is doing things the way they should be done. This makes Hashi think for a bit, and then he asks her if this also applies to what she had told him earlier. She does not get what he means, so he reminds her about her encounter with him earlier in the morning. He wants to confirm if she was being serious about him only doing naughty things to her, so she says that it has to be the case if she is to become the next elf queen. This is a bit confusing for Hashi, and then he sees Yama walking in an odd direction. He tells her that this is not the way to the mansion, but she says that it's a part of her daily routine to visit the shrine. Basically, it is the Arutami shrine where she heads straight to the main area and sits down for her prayers. Hashi watches on as Yama prays to the spirits to keep her safe, but he does not understand why a girl like her would be praying to a shrine and its gods. That's when he hears a voice telling him that the ones enshrined here are the ancestors of the Japanese elves. This voice is from none other than the Queen Elf Yami. So our hero is naturally shocked to see her here. Yami says that she is the current queen of the land, so she has to be a priestess to this shrine. The Queen Elf mentions how her ancestors rest here, but Hashi thought that elves would have a different kind of system to honor those who have passed. Yami simply says that one should do in Rome as the Romans do. This was what her ancestors wanted in the first place, and it makes sense to see one of the most sacred places in Japan being used as a sacred ground for the elves. Hashi finally gets it now, but this means that Yama has been visiting her ancestors and parents for each and every day. He feels that she is being a bit too earnest, which does seem a bit suspicious, mainly because it is what a desperate person would do. Now, we move to the mansion during the nighttime where our hero is with his elf girl in bed. She wants him to do naughty things to her, but he feels a bit shy. Yama says that it's fine because she's already studied about this kind of thing before. However, this is not what Hashi meant when he asked her to wait. She becomes a bit restless and asks him why he is acting this way, so he decides to ask her why she is being so desperate. He knows that Suki is the oldest elf girl in the family, so it makes sense for her to become the elf queen. So, it does not make any sense for Yama to be so worried about becoming queen, as she is younger than Suki. Yama says that it's actually the other way around and she wants to become the elf queen mainly because she is the second daughter. 
Hashi has a clueless look on his face. So Yama tells him to forget whatever it was that Suki may have told him earlier. Basically, ever since they lost their parents, the girls have been raised by Suki as if she was their mother. As it sounds, this is a very big responsibility to bear, especially for a girl as young as Suki. Hashi agrees with her, and then he learns that Suki had once pushed herself to the point where she fainted in front of the other girls. She still can't forgive herself for making her own sister struggle so much up until that point, which is why she wants to make a difference here. Essentially, this may not be a way for her to atone for being ignorant, but she does want to take the burden off Suki, which is why she feels that she should be the one to become the next elf queen. This is why she goes to the shrine every day and tries to be a role model for everyone around her. If she is able to become the ideal elf girl, then she can ask all her other sisters to let her become the elf queen. She wants to succeed Yami for this very reason and has taken this responsibility upon herself. Now that she has explained herself to Hashi, Yama lies down on the bed and tells him to hurry up if he gets what she means. She has already resolved herself, so our hero is free to do whatever he wants to her. This line makes him interested because every boy out there would love to get the free license with a girl like Yama. She then assumes a flirty pose and tells him that he can do all the lewd stuff he wants. Basically, he should help her the same way he helped her yesterday with all his shady intentions. As a matter of fact, she makes a cute face and says that she wants even more than what he did last time. She reasons that even Hashi's desires must have piled up by now, so his inner beast must be striving to unleash itself. The need of the hour hits our hero harder than anything else, so he awakens his shady intentions and gets down to business right away. She clearly seems to be liking what he's doing, so she tells him to continue with his intrusive thoughts. A few minutes pass by and Yama is at her wit's end, but her ears have still not turned into elf ears. Her body is reacting the right way and they've done a lot of shady stuff, so none of this makes any sense. This leads Hashi to figure that if he does the same things that he did last time, then it will not do him or Yama any good. The elf girl says that her body might have gotten used to all the sensation from these touches, but Hashi argues that he's done a bit more than what he did yesterday. The awakening is not happening at all, so Yama decides to bear it all and she demands Hashi to do more amazing things to her. Our hero asks her to be a bit modest at least, but she says that she has to become the Queen Elf, no matter what the cost may be. She wants him to continue, so our hero also decides there's no point in holding back now. An intense session follows, and it looks like Hashi has done the trick, but he says that he's not finished with Yama yet. He goes on to give quite the performance, and it leads to Yama turning into her elf form again. Our hero believes that she has become queen now, but she says that she has only awakened as an elf as of now. She is yet to achieve queen status, which means that she needs Hashi to do more shady things to her. Our hero can't believe that he'll need to do more, but she says that he has to continue, especially after doing so much to her already. It looks like Yama can't get enough of Hashi, so she keeps him awake all night long. After an endless session of unspeakable acts that happen over a period of time, we move to another fine day in school where classes are underway. Both Yama and Hashi are here attending their classes, but the moment the bell rings, the elf girl tells her lover boy to rush home with her so that they can pick up from where they left off. She feels that she's getting used to his actions now, so she might just become the elf queen tonight. Hashi is not too keen on doing these lewd things today as well, so Yama feels offended and asks him if he does not like her body. She goes on to reason that it would be better if she became queen as soon as possible, because that would put an end to his impulses as well. Hashi agrees with her, but he is not sure if he can be used as a piece of meat so often. Either way, 
She drags him away from class and the other students wonder what's going on between them. Soon enough, they're back in the mansion and Yama gets her uniform off as soon as possible. She wishes to go ahead this way because it would be a waste of time for her to change clothes as well. Naturally, Hashi is a bit taken aback by how direct Yama is being with him. But then something odd happens. He is not reacting to her the same way he did last night. So she asks him what's going on. That's when he realizes that he is not feeling any intrusive thoughts anymore. Yama does not understand why this is happening, so Hashi reasons that this might be because they have been doing shady things day after day. Now that he does not have any impulses inside him anymore, all of Yama's efforts seem to have gone to waste. This causes her to lose her mind, because she might not be able to become an elf queen now. Now, we're back in class where we see both Yama and Hashi sitting next to each other, but not saying anything at all, probably because they have just been in an awkward situation. One of the girls in class asks Yama if something has happened between her and our hero, but she says that all is well. Now, we move to a flashback to see what exactly went down after our hero had performance anxiety. Yama confronts him over not excited anymore, and she asks if he does not have the drive to do shady things to her anymore. He confirms her worst fears, so she asks him if he's gotten tired of her. Of course, Hashi tries to calm her down by saying this is not the case. He then states that it could be because his impulses can't keep up with her. This leads Yama to figure out that it might be because of mana, especially because of what the Queen Elf said. Basically, since Hashi's intrusive thoughts and shady acts are like a form of mana interference, it might have gotten drained because she has been asking for it every day. Now that she has understood the cause of our hero's performance anxiety, she says sorry to him. He asks her why she is apologizing for it because he is the one who was brought here to fulfill his role. He then says sorry to her for being useless, which causes Yama to feel bad. She screams and says that Hashi has got it wrong and she is the one who should be taking the blame. This leads to another argument between the couple and it causes a hilarious scene. With so many other girls to play with, how exactly is our hero going to tackle his performance anxiety? Can he awaken his intrusive thoughts once again? Like, share, and subscribe if you like this story and want me to continue. If this video hits 50,000 views, then I'll cover part 2 for sure. Okay then, see you in the next one.